This video is sponsored by NTT Research. We need to talk. Tons of companies are now showcasing how they are working on quantum computers and how quantum computers are going to change computing forever, etc., etc. But everything I've seen online, honestly, is so abstract that you end up still wondering what quantum computers are at all, and then also, what are they actually going to do for us? NTT Research, a company at the forefront of quantum computing, actually agrees with me on that. And they asked if I would help them shed some light on this particularly complicated topic. So after asking their actual quantum scientists way too many questions, I think we're probably ready. So in this Decoder episode, my explainer series here on the channel, let's talk about what quantum computing actually is, why it's better than traditional computers, and what it'll actually solve for us in the future. So first, we need to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics, but don't worry, I won't get into the weeds on it. And honestly, it's just really fascinating. Firstly, quantum mechanics can be described as the physics of extremely small. In our case, subatomic particles. For example, photons, the nuclei of an atom, or electrons. Now we're all relatively familiar with the laws of physics and how matter will interact in our daily lives. The interesting thing about quantum mechanics though, is when things get to that subatomic level, they start to play by different rules. So for example, if you threw a tennis ball against a wall, you'd expect it to bounce back. But if this tennis ball was an electron, well, sometimes it would bounce back, and sometimes it just appears on the other side of the wall. And this phenomenon is called quantum tunneling. And to be clear, it's not a theory. It's an experimentally repeatable and proven thing. Quantum scientists just expect it, even if it is hard for those of us living in a larger world to comprehend. And there's a ton of other phenomenon like that that are equally odd and just as repeatable and valid. And I'm telling you this because there are a few of these properties that are very important to quantum computing. And it's within these weird phenomenon that quantum computing gets a lot of its power from which we'll talk about more in a sec. For now though, let's talk about the gist of what a quantum computer is made of. Quantum computers come in a variety of different forms, but essentially they all boil down to the same idea of taking some sort of quantum particle, and in our case, we'll use electrons, but it could be ions, the nucleus of an atom, etc., and then containing them in a way that they can be manipulated and measured. In traditional digital computers, information is encoded in the form of bits. A bit is either zero or one, on or off. And there are a lot of bits together in your computer, your phone, etc., that can then be used to make calculations by changing those bits. Now, looking at the image of a sample quantum computer, the equivalent of those bits are called qubits or quantum bits, and they're contained in this small part here. The rest of what you see is essentially cooling. The reason for this is that unlike traditional silicon bits, the quantum bits are very easily interfered with, with any level of heat or just other subatomic particles in the environment around the computer. So to mitigate this, the qubits are kept at near zero Kelvin, AKA the temperature at which particles aren't energized have very little to no movement. Taking a closer look at the qubits, we might have an electron suspended using a magnetic field, for example. That electron will spin on its axis, and when it does, a small magnetic field is created, similar to the Earth's magnetic field because of its spin. Now, also like the Earth, this magnetic field ends up coming from one direction or pole and flowing to the other. The electron's own magnetic field when suspended in another magnetic field will naturally align its poles with the magnetic field's direction. Think of it like the needle of a compass aligning with the Earth's magnetic field. Since this is the natural state of the electron or qubit requiring the least energy, we can think of this as the equivalent of the zero state in traditional bits, called spin down in this case. In a similar way to manually moving the needle of a compass with your finger to point south instead of north, those electrons can be charged with energy to point in the opposite direction. We'll call this spin up. And you can think of this as the one in terms of traditional bits. So now we have our two states that we're used to in traditional computing, zero 
and one. But unlike traditional bits, those electrons and qubits are actually spinning in all directions at once, in another strange phenomenon specific to quantum mechanics called superposition. Essentially, the qubit is spinning in every direction possible within a sphere, mathematically represented by fractions between 0 and 1, that indicate the probability of it being spin up or spin down, 1 and 0. It's only once we stop and read its state that it chooses up, 1, or down, 0. It's this superposition third state that gives quantum computers their unique abilities. Let's say, for example, we have two qubits and two traditional bits. For both of these systems, we have the options of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So four different states of the system itself with two classical bits of information. But the qubits also have that superposition of each of those bits as well to work with. So you would get the equivalent of four classical bits of information to represent each of the possible states, i.e. we would need four numbers to know the state of the system versus the two numbers for the classical one. If we added another bit and qubit to these two systems, we would get three bits of information for the traditional system, but eight for the quantum system. And it's this exponentially more bits of information that continues to the tune of two to the nth power, where n is the number of qubits. So you can see pretty quickly how much more power can be gained from this system exponentially. There's another quantum property that needs to occur for this to hold true, and that's quantum entanglement, which is the phenomenon that two quantum entangled particles, let's use our two electrons as an example, will always display the opposite of the other one instantly, no matter how far apart they are. So, for example, if we have two quantum entangled electrons and we look to see what direction one is spinning, and let's say it's spin up, then the other is automatically going to be spin down, and vice versa. This will be true every single time so long as those two qubits are entangled. Now Einstein actually called this spooky action at a distance. And just like the other quantum properties we've been talking about, we don't really understand why it happens. But we also don't really need to. We just know that it's proven and that it happens all the time. Early sailors didn't know about the particles in the air that was moving the sails of their ships. They just knew that they could use the wind to move their sailboats. Lastly, for these spooky things, we have the fact that quantum particles' state is changed by the act of observing them. So, that superposition is happening, but as soon as we observe the state of the qubit, it'll either be up or down. We can't observe or measure the superposition state itself. So, while the computer is running, superposition is a state we can use, but as soon as we go to read the results, we only have zeros and ones. Now, obviously, that might seem like a bit of an issue, but thankfully, math doesn't care. Using special quantum algorithms, you can actually use the probability of the superposition to do your calculations, and then when they are done, come up with a usable state that can be read. And it's because of this unique requirements and probability factor that quantum computers won't always be faster than traditional computers in some cases. And in some cases, actually, they'll be a lot slower. Instead, they can solve problems with an enormous number of variables way faster than a traditional computer can. In fact, the more potential outcomes and steps a problem has, the more efficient a quantum computer will be over a traditional computer. One popular example is called the traveling salesman problem, originally proposed in 1930, and one of the most intensely studied problems in optimization. The problem states that if you have a list of cities for a salesman to travel, what is the best route to take to hit all of the cities in the most efficient way while starting and ending at the same city? A traditional computer might go through every single route possible until it finds the shortest one that it can. With a few cities, this isn't too bad, but as the number of cities grows, this can bog down even the best supercomputers out there. A type of quantum computer called an Ising machine using a quantum algorithm called the Ising model could solve this in a fraction of the time. Recently, NTT Research's Physics and Informatics Lab has actually partnered with Caltech's Department of Applied Physics and Material Science to take on the goal of building the world's fastest Ising machine. To explain what that is, nature likes to optimize energy naturally. A cool way to demonstrate this is to use metronomes. I'll leave a link to the video that I found below. But basically, if there's a way for energy to easily transfer between the metronomes, they will eventually synchronize to become a more efficient system. This also happens in the cells of your heart beating in rhythm, you see it in schools of fish swimming together, etc. 
The Ising machine uses a collection of spinning particles and all connected so that they can interact with one another in a similar way to the metronomes. In the case of this problem, each spinning particle will represent one of the potential cities and can be calibrated to represent the distance between the cities. They are all set spinning and then through the quantum interaction, they will all eventually synchronize to the lowest energy state, showing the solution. In a way, it's like old analog computers back in the day that used cogs and drums with divots to calculate firing trajectory and angle on a Navy ship. I'll leave a link below to a training series of videos for that exact analog computer from the 50s, complete with the 1950s voice. Fire control computers solve fire control problems. That I found while researching for anyone who wants to learn more about that fascinating, often forgotten start to computers that we use today. Now, a traveling salesman might not truly illustrate how important a machine like this is, but imagine anything with a ton of variables and a similar optimization need. Drug discovery is a pretty big one that comes to mind. Modern drug development takes decades because of the sheer number of compounds and proteins that must be tested in infinite combinations. This could save millions of lives by exponentially shortening the time it takes from targeting a disease to developing a treatment from years to seconds, potentially. Machine learning, such as image and speech recognition, could scan exponentially more neural networks at once to deliver results in a fraction of the time, car and air traffic control, the list just goes on and on. And it's these types of problems that quantum computers of various designs will ultimately help us solve a lot faster than traditional digital computers and even supercomputers today can. So, when will all of this happen? Well. Kazuhiro Gomi, the president and CEO of NTT Research, has said that he expects these applications to become a reality in the next 10 years. But there you go, my best attempt at trying to succinctly explain something that is very complicated. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below of this video of Quantum. Don't forget to uh, check out the research that NTT is also doing at the link in the description below. Again, thanks to them for letting me bother the crap out of their scientists and for partnering with me to do this video. If you like this video, please thumbs up it or share it. It's greatly appreciated. Also check out the rest of the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next to the word subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.